Okay, welcome back to the Myth Informed podcast. We are podcasting on April 2nd, 2017. My name is Brian Edward of Myth Assist Milwaukee, along here with Sean Frasick. Hello. President of our esteemed, can I say that without yes, conceit? Absolutely. Organization. <laughs> um, we are with uh, Tony Ortega today. We have him on the line. Um, Tony Ortega is a journalist and former editor of The Village Voice. He's written about Scientology since 1995 and in May of 2015 released a book about Scientology's harassment of Paulette Cooper titled The Unbreakable Miss Lovely. He continues to monitor breaking developments in Scientology, in the Scientology world rather, um, from an undisclosed location somewhere in an underground bunker. Yeah, and we had Tony on a couple months back, and it was a fantastic interview that really looked at the origins of Scientology and how L. Ron Hubbard borrowed uh, all of his teachings from other cult leaders in the sense of uh, uh, blood magic and things like that. And it's a fantastic interview. If you haven't heard that, you really would get a, a wide scope of how Scientology came to be, where L Elrond got all these ideas for this this uh, cult. Uh, but today we want to do yeah. something a little different. We wanted to look at uh, modern day and look at all of a sudden this recent popularization of Scientology. We're starting to see it everywhere. It's a and es channels. Movies are coming out. Uh, people are coming out left and right. Uh, so, Tony, thank you again. Welcome. Welcome to the yeah. show. And I Thanks for having me back, guys. And I really couldn't think of... Uh, it anyone who is really more qualified to talk about in this. So you really are an expert Absolutely. on the topic. So I wanted to say that that first off, um, where do we want to start? <laughs> that, that, that's the bigger question. Where do we want to start? Uh, well, um, I did. I did. Uh, so we looked at uh, the Underground Bunker blog, Tony's blog. And one thing that popped out at me is Scientology TV. Uh, is this really happening, Tony? Yeah, this is something that uh, David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology, has been talking about for quite a long time. Back in uh, 2011, uh, he spent, uh, I'm not sure how much money, I think $5 million, something like that, for this five-acre studio compound in Hollywood that was being used by the uh, uh, really well-known public television station there called KCET. And um, it just, you know, it took him five years to, to renovate it, but they... Like he always does, they they pressured the members to come up with donations so they could renovate these studios and you know really turn it into this beautiful you know uh, new facility. But then you know th what they were they were telling their members was give us the money because we're going to turn this into Scientology Media Productions (SMP) and this thing is going to reach every human being on the planet. They're going to have a twenty four hour television station and they're going to send messages out to every smartphone in the world. So that was the message they had for a couple of years. And, you know, they really put pressure on their people to give them money. So this thing opened uh, last May. And it really, we got the impression, we, you know, I have several correspondents. We all watch Scientology's every move, you know. And it, it looked to all of us like this was really being rushed. And, and then it, it, they had this big ceremony and then nothing happened. And so we were all wondering, well, what was that all about? I mean, where's this 24-hour television station? And I looked around and I asked about what would it take to get a station on a cable network. And apparently it's very expensive and very difficult. And uh, then he started asking for more money to open it. To, I mean, to, to like to actually do something. And we thought, we thought what a what a ripoff. You know, he, he has them pay for the renovation. Now he's, he wants even more money to actually do something. And I think most of us kind of wrote it off as, as a failure – and then just the other day, uh, one of my correspondents noticed that now if you search on the Spectrum Cable System, which is uh, the new name for Time Warner Cable, they now have a Scientology TV channel, which is not broadcasting anything yet, but they've obviously set it aside. And it's got various uh, titles for upcoming shows that sound like the same old videos you can already see on Scientology's YouTube channel. But it looks like he's really going to do it. They're going to have a 24-hour wow. Scientology TV channel on the Spectrum. And Spectrum is like the second biggest cable system in the country. Um, and I, won't be, I wouldn't be surprised if it pops up on some others. They, I cannot get an actual start date out of the – I tried to contact the Spectrum people. and They won't uh, return my calls. Um, 
but it looks like he's going to do it. And and he you know he he will probably just air the same old videos you can see now on their YouTube channel. But I have a feeling he's going to air, you know he's going to create some shows for that as well. Interesting. Um, which could be I mean a laugh riot if you ask me. But uh, you know it, it may it may actually reach some people that are curious about Scientology. Well, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, just imagine the amount of content you would need for a twenty four seven channel on oh, any it's topic. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you really would. I mean, that I, I want to check this out. I, I recently switched to Time Warner, so um, Spectrum. I, 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 sorry, Spectrum. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why they're going to claim we're not getting back to you. We're, right. we're we have a big merger to complete. <laughs> right, right. But I, I'm interested. Do, do they have titles? Have, have you checked this out, Tony? Do, do the titles pop up if I if I fast forward in the guide? Yeah, there's a. If you look at my story on it, there's a. I provided a link uh, to where there's a page of titles. And they just sound like the kind of things that you can already find um, at their. They, you know, they have a website, Scientology.org, right. and they have a they have a um, a YouTube channel that I check out once in a while to make because that's where you see the new commercials popping up. And if you look at that particular site that I provided a link to, you'll see some titles like "Drug Free World Part One," <laughs> um, "Youth for Human Rights," uh, "What Is Real Education." <laughs> and an overview of Scientology. So, I mean, those are titles that sound just like the kind of things you can already see at their at their uh, channel. Which, you know, they don't um, when when they put them on television. When they actually buy an ad, they generally get you know they don't. People kind of scratch their heads like, what are they trying? To, right? Who are they trying to sell this? It's to, very you know? vague, right? It's very vague, and yeah, because one of the you know key ideas about Scientology is they don't really tell you much up front. Right. There's only there's only so much they can tell you, and so it just comes off as kind of a you know uh, self help group with sort of cheesy '90s style info commercials. You know. Yeah, right. I, I remember those. I, I was a, a kid. I don't know if I was in high school or, or junior high, but I would hear all the time. Have you read Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard? Right. And they'd ask a question. It's on television. Answer page 57. Right. Ask another kind of like very metaphysical question. Answer on page 98. And I thought, what? what is this? This is interesting. And my mom's like, no, no, you don't need to read that. And then I never considered it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think well, that's the uh, that's kind of the the bait and switch, right? They that's the model. It's, it's self help. You know, come in, learn some new communication skills, learn some things that can help you in your life, and then that's when the you know when they tack on all the other stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's you know, uh, I've always felt that you know, it's it's the, the, the information control is mostly about money because how many people would pay to join if they were told you up front that. You know, down the road, you'd be searching for million-year-old memories of traumatic <laughs> incidents in order to remove your current, you know, backache or something. Right? You know, it's just, it's just so weird if you talk about it. Up, so they don't, they can't be upfront. I mean, speaking of of like backache, um, you know, and, and headache, we we interviewed um, Ron Miscavige um, in in studio. And he mentioned that that was kind of the what brought him to Scientology in the first place was like this cure actually was asthma um, for for this amazing for David yeah the, the, for this incredible asthma that he had and that that he they that tried, David had right that David had that they would go into cold showers together because that was the only relief and then Scientology had produced like an effect which probably placebo but th this gets into wow that you know. Probably a misconnection is is why this all started. You know, if if that hadn't happened, David Miscavige is not the leader of Scientology. Well, everybody has a different sort of story about what got them in, and and faith healing is actually not as common as some of the other ones. I mean, people, so many people I've talked to had a bad breakup, you know, relationship problem, or they'd lost a job, or they were fresh out of college and were really confused about what they wanted to do with their lives. Uh, not, you know, you, you do hear the, the healing stories about how, you know, I had this problem and Scientology solved it, but it's not, it's not, that doesn't seem to be its biggest draw. It seems to me, I mean, it's, it's definitely one of the things that's in the mix, but uh, definitely at, when it's first started, uh, L. Ron Hubbard made a lot of health claims mm -hmm. about what you could do with that e-meter. And, you know, he, if you read Dianetics, he makes the claim that virtually every ailment known to man is psychosomatic. And so if you could just heal the mind, then you'll heal your, you'll heal your body. Incredible. Incredible. Like, what did, did you read um, 
Ron's book and what, what's your thoughts of it? And then I thought maybe we could get into um, Tony Rathburn's. Mar- Marty uh, Rathburn. Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> Marty sure. Rathburn's, um, you know, review of it on his blog, although it was back in the summer. I thought Ron's book was very important. You know, I think it was really important for people to hear from David Miscavige's own father about how he was treated and that, and that Ron saw his son turn into this dictator. Uh, I think that's just devastating for David Miscavige. And it's one of the reasons why Ron has faced maybe uh, the fiercest and most and slimiest retaliation campaign since Paulette Cooper. I mean, you know, the stuff online about Ron is just amazing. And it's just all put on there by his son that just is so unhappy that he put this book out. So that should tell you how much this book is really uh, scares David Miscavige is that he's tried so much to, to you know, slander it online. Um, there were some things about Ron's book I wasn't thrilled about, um, but, but uh, you know, he he I think he um, was trying to um, keep L. Ron Hubbard's reputation from being too harmed in his book. I, I don't think he should have worried about that. I think he should have just focused on you know what he saw and what he experienced. But other than that, I thought it was I thought it was a really important book. And then, yeah, the, what you you were referring to is um, his book came out in in May, and he was on uh, ABC Twenty Twenty Four. It was a great great show. And then in uh, August, Marty Rathman, who we really hadn't been hearing much from, um, put out this vicious attack on it and said some things that were kind of bizarre about how he had given advice to Ron not to write it and stuff like that, which Ron says is not true. Um, and then he tried to like um, he tried to undercut one of its most central sort of themes. And uh, one of the things that uh, you, you learn in Ron's book is that he was followed by these private investigators who were hired by his own son, right? And uh, the police came to him and said, "Listen, these two private investigators are following you." And one of the, and one of the most striking things is they admitted that one day when they were watching Ron cross a parking lot, they saw him fumbling at his chest. Well, what was actually happening was he had a smartphone in a shirt pocket and it was coming out and he was just trying to grab hold of it. But from across the parking lot to a couple of private investigators following a 77-year-old man, it looked like an old guy having a heart attack. So they called their handler and according to their testimony to the police, David Miscavige himself came on the line and told them – because they wanted to know – see, their whole job was to follow Ron without him knowing it. So if they rushed over to help him, it would blow their cover sure. and they'd lose their $10,000 a week job. And so they, were, they weren't sure what to do. And so David Miscavige came on the line and said, listen, if it's his time, it's his time. If, if he dies, he dies. And, and the private investigators told the police this. It's in the police report. Um, and what Marty Rathbun tried to do in his blog post, which is so bizarre, he said this can't be true. Because I personally worked with David Miscavige for 20 years, and I never once saw him talk directly to a private investigator. Well, wow. <laughs> I, very, okay. I very quickly pointed out <laughs> on my own blog that Marty Rathbun in one of his books talks about David Miscavige talking directly to a private investigator. Right. And I had also interviewed a couple of other former private investigators who were suing the church who both claimed that they were given directions directly from David Miscavige. So, it, you know, it was just an odd thing for Marty to try to do to try to destroy this book. It didn't seem to make a lot of sense. But if you know, I, I did a story recently kind of tracing his whole progression that at, at one time – you know, Marty Rathman at one time was the second highest official in the entire Church of Scientology. He was a he was an enforcer. He was a fixer. He was one that took care of problems for David Miscavige. He left in 2004, disappeared to the point where some of us thought he was dead. And then in 2008, he resurfaced and then started this blog where he was criticizing David Miscavige and really rallied this whole independent Scientology community to him. Uh, and there's no question, by 2010, 2011 – this was the single biggest threat to David Miscavige's leadership of the Church of Scientology. I mean, everybody read Marty's blog. Everybody was just fascinated by the people that were announcing their independence on his website. Um, and then 
Is that both it, within and outside of Scientology? Is that just ex-Scientologists reading his blog in 2010 or 11, or is that people within that are still part of the fold? Well, that's the point I made to other journalists that asked me about it. I said, look, I, you know, I've been writing about Scientology since 1995, and every once in a while I hear from somebody who comes out and says, yeah, I started secretly reading your stuff. and then I, but, but you know that for the most part, Scientologists are very good at ignoring anything journalists write, mm-hmm. okay? But Marty, Marty Rathbun, people inside know him. They knew, they knew his name at least, and his blog reached so much farther into the church than anything. Because people were curious. They wanted to know what had happened to these guys, Marty Rathbun. If not, if just for the gossip, you might, you might want to read it, but then you start to, that might there change no, your mind. There was no question that, that people inside the church were okay. reading his website, and that's what made it so dangerous. And that's why, Mar- that's why Miscavige put him under such a hellacious, uh, you know, uh, retaliation uh, program called the Squirrel Busters, mm-hmm. and and ultimately he, which they sued over. His wife uh, Monique was never a member of Church Scientology. In August 2013, she filed a lawsuit. Um, she said in court because they were about to adopt a child and they wanted, they didn't want that kind of harassment. And so they got a they got a court order. They got a temporary restraining order to make sure that they weren't messed with as the as the lawsuit was going on. And what was surprising to all of us is that you know they their attorneys were doing so well in that lawsuit over the next couple of years. But I mean, these things take time, you know? Um, and by November, 2015, they had had a, a fantastic appeals court victory that really paved the way to that lawsuit becoming a big problem for Scientology. And two months later, she fired the whole legal crew. And then a couple of months after that, dismissed the lawsuit. And to this day, Marty's really? never really given a, 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 an explanation of that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, not only to kind of walk away from all that and walk away from his blog, his his blog slowed down to almost nothing. Mm-hmm. But then to start attacking, you know, Ron Miscavige, and then and then five days after he he tried to basically sabotage Ron's book, he did the same thing to Louis Theroux's movie, my Scientology movie, just two days before it was opening in Australian theaters. And uh, Marty, uh, Marty was in that movie, correct? He's the uh, he's after Louis Theroux, he's the main character. Right. Right. When, when was the movie yeah. recorded? I mean, the when? movie was filmed in the fall of 2014. They were working on that for a long time. I first talked to their producers in like March 2012. Wow. And they were finally filming in um, the summer and fall of 2014. And then in December 2014 is when they had that. They were filming in L.A. And these uh, Scient- Scientologists showed up at the studio and um, – were harassing Marty and Marty pulled out his camera and Louis pulled out his camera and it becomes the kind of climactic scene of the whole movie. That was December, 2014. Okay. Um, so this is before the, they've kind of, the, the, before they ended up like canceling the lawsuit or, or, or dismissing it themselves. Right. That was about a year before. Yeah. And so then, so then um, Louis's movie first comes out. Uh, the world premiere was in London in October 2015 and I was there and after the movie showed and it's hilarious it's a wonderful movie it's a lot of fun I had some criticisms of it but it's 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 a very funny movie and you should see it if you haven't yeah at, at the end of the movie um Louis and John Dower the director came out uh, to talk to the audience and somebody asked well what did, you know what did Marty think and and John said well I got an email from him and he liked it and everybody everybody applauded that's great because as much as Marty doesn't come off great in that movie. I would, I, the, the old Marty would have been a good sport about it. Right. And, but I think people were wondering and, and he, and he was apparently, he said he liked it. Well, that was, that was October, 2015. Um, January, 2016 is when they, they fired the attorneys and in, in five days. And then, so then on August or September, 2016, five days after he had attacked Ron's book, then he went on a lengthy, obviously, you know, uh, something that had been written and edited, uh, attack on Louis film. And he called it dishonest. He called it deceitful, which, you know, this is a BBC production. They're going to take that seriously. I mean, uh, this, again, this looked to something like, looked like something to me that had been, some thought had put into it as to how can, you know, how can we sabotage this film? You know, I'm sure the BBC must have had real headaches over that. But it didn't stop it. It came out two days later in Australia. 
Then it opened in uh, England and it had a really successful run in England. And then it opened uh, here uh, just a few weeks ago. Okay. That it, I, when I noticed on his blog, he's referring to like the top anti-Scientology lawyer, which is a weird way to refer to somebody. I mean, to, if you're, it, it suggests ideologic. When you're well, saying, he, yeah, he, he, he used worse language than that. I mean, he, he, he talked about his own former attorney as a bottom dwelling uh, lawyer, which is, if you know yeah. Ray Jeffrey, is so untrue. I mean, this is the guy that, you know, it's, it, there are not very many attorneys in the country or the world who will take on the Church of Scientology. And he had, his, he had just like really kicked their butt uh, in the Debbie Cook case. In the, um, the 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 private investigators case, and and he was winning this case, and then he got the rug pulled out from under him. Why? Still no real explanation yet. Hmm. Right. He also goes after um, Ron himself, saying he has has a quote where he says, you know, and then I never laid a hand on my wife again, suggesting, you know, oh, he was a wife beater, so therefore you don't have to listen to him. He doesn't say those words, but that's absolutely implied yeah. with the suggestion. Is, is there truth to that? I mean, well, was, the, the, that's the, that's the, well, first of all, Ron talks in his own book about how the fact that he was violent with his wife yeah. and, and that's something that he's not proud of. And he's, he's mentioned, but what was really startling about both of those broadsides by Marty against both Ron Miscavige and Louis Theroux was that in each time he not only went after them as saying that they were deceitful and that kind of thing, but he defended David Miscavige in each of them. Yeah. That was so bizarre. And so that's why I feel like something's going on. We haven't heard the whole thing. Now he's just completely shut down. He's, he hasn't, he stopped talking about Scientology altogether. And, and now he's, there hasn't been a new post or comment in, in months. So Interesting. I don't know what's going on with that guy. Yeah. But well, he, that, that, he was asserting like that, that his son was like a psychopath which or, you know, a sociopath, one of the two, and that's probably true. But then Marty says, but, you know, that's the point. What do you do with those people? You disconnect. And he's saying, you know, how can you be undermining the de the, the concept of disconnection? Right. Which, this, well, that's, you can't well, do that. that. You know, and, and, you know, right away, I, I just figured, you know, it sounds like he's regressing. Obviously, I'm assuming I don't have any facts or anything, but it sounds like he's regressing. And, you know, I my first op uh, opinion was it could be could have something to do with the disconnect policy. I mean, because yeah. that is a very strong tool. And I don't know, you know, what family Marty has it. in the church, but. And he said, but that's what you have to do with psychopaths. You yeah. know, you've got to disconnect from them. Oh, yeah. that's tough. To so, so right now, Tony, we just don't know. We, we're just waiting to find out, huh? Yeah, I mean, the most recent thing that was kind of troubling was um, uh, there was a very interesting court case going on in Israel, of all places. <laughs> there's, a, there's a group. Um, uh, I know them well. I've, I've visited them. Danny and Tammy Lemberg are in Haifa, really wonderful people. And they, they, had, they were operating a Scientology mission that broke they broke away and became independent the whole mission it was really shocking kind of thing repudiation of miscavige and um they claimed that they were harassed over it and so they filed a lawsuit against the church of scientology a couple of years ago which which now reached a trial and so there was a trial going on in tel aviv uh and and danny lemberger was on the witness stand and i got transcripts of this okay and the um attorney the local attorney for the church uh, who was a partner in a big firm in Tel Aviv, was questioning Danny, and he said to him, um, now I contacted Marty Rathbun, and he gave me an email that you wrote to him in 2013, and I want to read to you from the email, and in the email it has various information. Well, that's just shocking, <laughs> because what, what, so I got the transcript that shows this attorney is saying that Marty Rathbun is not just criticizing people who who he used to you know support but he actually gave a private email from danny lemberger to the church of scientology mm. to use in litigation against him right i mean that's that is wow and i called marty on that and i i said listen you know or i emailed him and i said listen this is this is pretty bad i i've got proof that you are now actively cooperating with the church of scientology against its critics can you please address this? And he just he just said something mean to me and, and didn't address it at all. Wow. So that's that's really troubling. And and you know his people that like Marty are naturally trying to find ways to you know uh, interpret it in a different way and say maybe the email was stolen from him or something. 
But this is this was a partner in a major Israeli uh, law firm in open court saying that he called Marty and got this email from him. It would it would be pretty shocking for a, a, an attorney in that situation yeah. to lie right. and and not be you know not be telling the truth in that situation. So that's where we are now. It just seems like there's more questions about what's going on with him. And I am curious, just like you are, what happened to this guy? Because look at what, you know, at one point, Marty Rathbun and Mike Rinder were completely changing the public's conception of what the Church of Scientology was, right? I mean, up to that point, we all laughed at Xenu because of South Park. And there was, you know, people would just basically make fun of the OT levels and stuff. Along comes Marty Rathbun and Mike Rinder and some other really good people like Amy Scobie and, and Jefferson Hawkins. They totally changed the conversation and said, no, look, this is an organization that's hurting people. This is a leader who, you know, imprisons his own employees, et cetera. You know, the two people who were most effective, I would say, in the media were Marty Rathbun and Mike Rinder. Now, just a couple years later, Marty's doing these really strange things. He's completely out of the media spotlight. And what's Mike Rinder doing? Mike Rinder is now the co-star of this incredibly popular cable TV show, which is about to have its second season with Leah Remini. I mean, you couldn't have had two more divergent paths. Yeah, right? and that's that's one of the things we we definitely wanted to touch on was Leah's show. I mean, this really brought Scientology into uh, into popularity in in a sense. I mean, there's people that you know are Jews, Christians, Muslims, whatever. They're really interested in Scientology because of a show like Leah's and all of a sudden we're seeing it kind of everywhere. Uh, the first season I think was really powerful had huge, huge numbers according to A&E. And now they just got renewed for a second season. And a lot of it's focused on the disconnection policy and the actual the hurt that it does to people. Uh, so what, what do you make of the second season of the show and where do you think they're going to take it? I think it's going to be even more effective. I mean, you know, the first season um, I think surprised everyone because some of the stories they were telling had, were very well known already. I mean, I think if you if you knew something about Scientology, you, you might have heard about the Headleys. You might know about Mike Rinder already. But there's something about Leah that, that she makes it personal. And she you can tell how much she personally cares about each story. She, you know, it it was just such a knockout and, and people reacted in such a strong way. Um, and yeah, I, I think it surprised everyone just how well it did. So, so what does she do on a second season? Right? Well, I think, you know, that first season, it was okay to go back and look at some stories that maybe weren't that fresh. So I think in the second season, what they want to do is, is to get stuff that's more happening right now. And, um, they're looking into some stories that I think are, are, are maybe a little bit more, uh, fast moving and, and, I think it's going to be extremely powerful. I've been talking to a couple of their producers and, and, and they're looking at, you know, they're definitely looking at, at some of the stuff on my website. And so, you know, it could be, you can see that David Miscavige is really freaking out. Um, that was the point I've been making at my website. And I'm going to have something new tomorrow about that too, that, um, I was a little surprised when, you know, Leah, Leah's defection became public in the summer of 2013 and then her book came out in uh, October or November 2015. And through that whole period, they didn't really harass her the way, you know, Jason Begay got it, and Paul Haggis, Mike Rinder, Amy Scobie. I mean, I was a little I, – I wondered if maybe Miscavige was a little afraid of Leah, you know, because she was not getting the, the usual treatment. But this, the, they, in fact, they did start a website last year uh, or just a few months ago when the, when the first season started at the end of November. They started a website to attack it, but it pretty much just attacked the guests uh, that were showing up on it. They did, the, the attacks on Leah were, 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 again, just not that strong. And I wondered about that. Well, the minute they announced the second season, that website got so much more vicious on Leah. And you can t you can see now that they are having the private investigators dig into her past, look for friends and families that will family that will say th negative things about her, and they're really going after her the way they go after everybody. And you know, all it does, of course, is reinforce everything she's saying about right. them. Right. Exactly. 
Exactly. And that's, you know, we've had a couple of people on talking about Scientology, and that's one of the things that personally drives me crazy is the fact that if they just had a better PR manager, you know, if they would <laughs> just get rid of the disconnection policy, if they would start saying, you know, L. Ron Hubbard's teachings were from a different time and, you know, he was mentally ill, we're going to change all that and we're going to go back to helping humanity. And, you know, like going after someone like Leah, she has friends and, you know, she was she did Bill Maher. She was on Joe Rogan's podcast. I mean, she's super connected, yeah. you know, in the in the L.A. world and. You know, going after someone like her is the dumbest thing that they can do because she has so much influence in that world. And but that's that's Scientology. You know, I mean, one of the first things you learn about it when you start to research is you find that what's fascinating about it is that it all comes from L. Ron Hubbard. And since he died in 1986, they can't change anything. And one of the things that he established in the 50s and 60s was how to attack enemies. And he just created a playbook for it, and they follow it to the letter. So it's not that it's not so much that they think, hey, this is a good strategy to attack Leah's show. Let's do this. They're thinking, what would L. Ron Hubbard want us to do? And then they just do it. They don't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. Yeah. Uh, and that's just one of the things I think is most fascinating about this group. What you're describing is fundamentalism, right? We're going very, to take the text much a literally. Group. Yeah, and and uh, fundamentalists absolutely hate schisms, which is, sounds like that's kind of what was happening in the Tel Aviv case. That you know they they were like a break off. We're we're going to be Scientology under a different leadership. We're not going to follow the Pope, if you will. You know, like that David Miscavige. And I, I think that if you're a fundamentalist, you hate schisms. I mean, could that be his motivation? Oh, always. It's it, in, in fact, I think that um, that's if. If you want to understand why Hubbard created those harsh policies, that's what it was about. See, you know, when Hubbard first started all this, he called it a science. You know, the, the original title of, of Dianetics is Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. Well, the nature of us, of, and, and some of them still to this day, when they come out after 40 years, uh, they'll tell you, oh, it's called the church, but really it's a science. It, Tony, it's an exact science. Well, um, I mean, they use science to discover these 10 million year old memories, whatever. Right. Well, the nature of a science is that <laughs> once one person discovers something, then another researcher should be able to discover it on their own and replicate those results. That's one of the most fundamental basic ideas of science. But so from the beginning, from 1950, from the, the first you know, day that Dianetics came out and people started to understand what, what Hubbard was, was getting at, he started that other people would say, you know what, that's a cool idea. Now I'm going to advance the science in my own way. Yeah. Right. And they would come up. There have been splinter groups and break off groups and competing groups from day one in the 50s, 60s, 70s, throughout history. There have always been people who said, thank you, Elron. Now I'm going to take these ideas and create my own version. And it drove him crazy. And, you know, some people, you know, if you're if you're a believer, you'll say, well, but L. Ron Hubbard really discovered things that were very um, dangerous and he didn't want anybody else messing with it. But, of course, the cynic says, no, he just didn't want to lose the income. Yeah, you know, no. I mean, he, he wants everybody mm -hmm. to do his science his way. So he gets the payments. Um, so that's that was part of the reason why he created these really strict rules that he then gave the cute name ethics. Right. And to mm -hmm. this day. They call it that. I mean, it's really about control and, and discipline, but they call it ethics. And they, they, they literally say it with a straight face that as Scientologists, they're the most ethical people on the planet. Yeah, well, speaking of ethics, that uh, is a great segue into our next topic that we wanted to touch on. And uh, I just want to make sure we can touch on this because this gets into the legal world. But uh, you had written a blog on Danny Masterson, who was better known as Stephen Hyde on that 70s show or his character in The Ranch, where he also co-stars with uh, Ashton Kutcher. Um, apparently, there was some scandal as far as uh, covering up rape. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what I reported. I, I, I have to be careful about, you know, what I can say. It's an ongoing investigation. That's what makes it sensitive. But I broke the news that the Los Angeles Police Department is actively investigating the allegations of three women who were each Scientologists who say they were raped by Danny Masterson. Um, and, and these happened quite a while ago. One of them was in 2001 and the other two were in 2003. And um, they only one of them came forward to the police at the time. 
Um, but they uh, alleged that that it was the Scientology that was trying to prevent them from reporting to the police. Um, and there, there are various reasons why they came forward now, but one of them was that I, I refer to them as victim A, B, and C. To, you know, I don't reveal their names. Right. Um, that victim A was inspired by Leah and Leah's show, and she reached out. In fact, she reached out to Leah before the show even started because – the publicity had started up over the summer, right? And Leah, you know, Leah hears from people every day that that have stories about things that happen to them in Scientology. And and, he, and she has said to me, she said, you know, I, I don't want to hear your stories. I want to hear that you're doing something about it. And so she encouraged this woman to do something about it. And so this woman, victim A, reported her uh, allegations for the first time. And the LAPD then um, took her case and realized that they had victim B's case already on file because victim B had 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 she had come forward in 2004, and so they reopened that case. And then a third woman, victim C, uh, also uh, approached the LAPD, and so um, the you know the, the LAPD is investigating those. Um, all three of the women knew Danny, and that makes you know look when you have an acquaintance rape allegation and a lot of times gone by mm -hmm. um i don't know how this is going to turn out all i know is i'm just reporting what the what was in the uh, the paperwork i got out of the lapd uh, investigation and i also had some witnesses that i interviewed so that's where that is and um uh and that's been i don't know three or four weeks now and so i'm i basically just have to wait to see what the lapd and the district attorney are going to do i can't really say much until then Right. On the, on the allegations themselves, I mean, how, how was Scientology involved as opposed to it being, you know, the allegations of one bad or person doing, a, you know, right. one person well, doing I, something really bad? Right. Victim, victim B's story, um, I think, was the most interesting uh, as far as the Scientology ang uh, involvement, because in her case, um, I, um, two of the three women are saying uh, that the – they were treated as they were they were treated as if they had done something wrong by the Church of Scientology, and victim B's case. Uh, uh, I learned about her specific um, allegations from a close family member who who talked to me, and it, that person says that after victim B came forward first to the church, um, they then put her through auditing. You get this. This is so Scientology. Mm. She she is telling the Church of Scientology, one of your celebrities raped me. So what did they have her do? They had her go through past life auditing to find uh, incidents in her past lives when she had harmed other people in order to explain why then she would become the victim in her current life. That's insane. That is a really that ass is, backwards version of victim. And Bain. not only are they putting her through that, but they charged her tens of thousands of dollars. Jeez. Wow. Jeez. Wow. That's, that's, I mean, it's sad, you know, it's sad, Brian. I know we talk about religion a lot, especially when we're, you know, covering up, you know, child molestations and things like that. I mean, it's just analogous to something you'd see from a Catholic church of the 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 guilt shaming type of thing, you know. The yeah. If you can see, but there's different defenses. I'm yeah. not sure if they'd use that one, but I mean, yeah, it right. would be like somebody telling one of the Charlie Hebdo folks, you know, in a past life, this 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 retribution that you got for drawing a cartoon was probably because you were an asshole in a past life. That's outrageous. Yeah, absolutely. And let me outrageous. just let me just emphasize that Danny Masterson has denied these charges, and he has not been arrested or charged with anything. This is still just in the investigation yeah. stage, and you know I want to make that clear. Right, Absolutely. and it's important to have a high bar. Accusations, no, no rape court, rape trial should ever be charged or adjudicated in the court of public opinion. So, right, right. I mean, these right. are allegations, and that's what they are. Right, right, and it's a, you know it's extremely unfortunate. And, uh, Tony, please you know keep us updated. I obviously, watch his blog on Underground Bunker. I'm sure as soon as something breaks, you, you know, one way or the other. Uh, it's right. going to be on there, and uh, yeah, that's that's fascinating. And uh, another thing that I caught on your blog that really caught my eye on this show, we talked to scholars that like to refute the existence of Jesus uh, as to even being a, a historical person. And 
Ressa right. Aslan is one of those people that really gets under my skin because not only is he vying for the historical Jesus, but he's vying for the historical Jesus of Islam, yes. which is like even worse because it comes centuries later after the original story supposedly started and um, has you know extremely ridiculous claims in it. But he he has a new show called The Believer where he goes around and he explores religions and call, and like uh, all the different practices and things like that. And he ends up talking about Scientology and you, you expected something out of him when he, when he went to the Scientology realm and we just didn't see it. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, look, I, I know about, you know, Reza's his, you know, career and, and, and how he kind of, He's very good at, at being on the media and he, he's very good at, at, at riling people up and, and um, just the fact that um, other people in the religious study field will call you know, question on his credentials and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That I don't care. I mean the guy is smart. He's well read and he's putting on a show. The, the, the objection I had was that his show on Scientology was just basically dishonest Um what he he is he is somebody that just doesn't think Scientology deserves the criticism that it gets for whatever reason. Uh, he's been saying that for years, um, and I think he wanted to go in and try and experience Scientology for himself with the church, and then come out and say, "Listen, everybody, it's not as it's, it doesn't deserve the criticism." But like Louis Theroux before him, uh, who was also trying to get that experience, the church says no. They don't, you know, the Church of Scientology does does not want that kind of embedded reporter experience, and they told him no. And so what he did then is he then went to the ind- independent Scientology community. Now I've written about the independent Scientology community for years. I think that that people who leave the Church of Scientology and want to practice auditing on their own should be allowed to do so as long as they want. Nobody should bother with them. Uh, and I have always admired Danny Lamberger for this, the principled stand he took to take his group independent and, and practice Scientology on his own. But see, I think what Reza was doing was basically dishonest because what he wanted to do was say that Alex Gibney and Larry Wright are, you know, we've heard too much of this stuff about abuses. I don't think Scientology, I think Scientology gets a bad rap. That's what he wanted to do. But he couldn't do it with the church. So he pretended that these independent Scientologists were this massive phenomenon. And that's the, that's the issue I have with it, yeah. especially in the interviews he gave coming up to the uh, episode. He talked about it flourishing, growing at an um, amazing rate. And he wanted to give the impression that there was this massive reformation. Yeah. He uses that word. Well, the reality is Scientology's dying, Okay. Uh, the biggest extent of Scientology was back in the year 1990. It had maybe 100,000 people around the world. It's now down to maybe 20,000 active members around the world. That's in the Church of Scientology. The vast majority of people who have left, so that, you know, thousands have left in the last 15, 20 years. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of them just throw, you know, give it up entirely. They're not, they're not only no longer in the Church of Scientology, they're not auditing, they don't want to have anything to do with L. Ron Hubbard or anything. The vast majority, a small number wants to continue to do Scientology the way that they, you know, typically they're older people that really loved what they were doing in the 70s and wish they could keep doing it. There's a small number of those folks. So what, what does Aslan do? Reza goes to, uh, he features two groups in particular. He, he featured Danny's group in Haifa. And again, I've been there. I love Danny and, 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 and more power to him and his little group in Haifa. And he went to this group in Reno. Now, I talked with Danny about this personally. When he broke away from the Church of Scientology five years ago, he had about 50 people. Okay, five years later, he's got 60. Mm. All right? right. This is the, the thing about these, these are people who are nostalgic for the way Scientology was. They're not bringing new people in. And that's not a slam on Danny. I'm not, I'm not criticizing him, okay? The group in Reno, they, they're, they have an annual convention. And according to a newspaper that covered it last year, there were 36 people there. Wow. Okay. Right. So these are these are people that had maybe some good experience in Scientology, don't, don't like the authoritarianism, and want to practice that independent of the power. And fine. And that's great. They can do that all they want. But for Reza to pretend 
this this massive reformation. Yeah, right. And he even he even said in one promo that it could become the next great world's religion. Wow, that's it's got an extraordinary claim. People in Reno, you know, right. So and and and, and I. I just didn't like that because really, really what he wanted to do was try to criticize people like Alex Gibney and Lawrence Wright and myself. They even used a little clip of me in there to make fun of me um, as if we're all like, uh, you know, we're all misrepresenting what Scientology yeah. is. Yep. And so I, I that I found dishonest. And and I just I, I, I hear from other other people who write about, you know, I, I don't obviously don't have enough knowledge to critic to critique his piece on hinduism as but but i hear from those groups as well that the way he that he's you know misinterpreting things mischaracterizing things so i just i just know on the scientology one i i found it dishonest yeah i don't he's uh, he would do this he does this with islam too he's an extreme apologist for anything yeah. he's covering and that's the one the the frustration i have with him always it's like instead of looking at the victims instead of looking at reality he has this like like fictional you know a picture of what's actually happening and he's yeah exactly yeah. he did it with islam and you know it, it, it to the point where it's just maddening yeah I, I, his vision's fine it's just not the facts that's right. it. you can't say that the women's mosque in la which is progressive and that seems fine i have no problems with that but you can't say that's the state of affairs of islam exactly. and say iran and saudi arabia exactly that right is, this is a small small group yeah yeah, and yeah, we appreciate that criticism on him. It's just kind of funny how we bridge the gap there a little bit. I mean, that's someone that's just been very frustrating for me over the years. But, you know, Tony, I mean, you're covering this all the time. Uh, you know, we see all these stories and, uh, you know, now we're starting to see like, you know, how the entertainers are getting, you know, wound up in this. Obviously, they, they always kind of have with Scientology, but some actual dirt starting to come out. Where where do you see Scientology? You know, do you see it in its death spiral? What are Ms. David Miscavige's options right now? What 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 do you see? You know, coming up. Well, I think something interesting is going on uh, because he's still Miscavige wants to promote this idea that Scientology is growing. It's not. So how does he pretend that he is? Mainly through real estate. He buys these new buildings around the world. And has shows up for these grand openings and then pretends that this is expansion. And it's really not. What he's doing is he's in each city around the world where they have a church, he's just taking a, an old church and replacing it with a new one um, so he can have a grand opening ceremony. That's not expansion, but he pretends that it is. Um, and so they just opened one in New Zealand um, and, and San Fernando Valley. They're going to open one in Miami next, I think. Um, and that's so that's on the one hand what he's trying to do to convince people that it's growing. But, you know, if you read Mike Rinder's blog, for example, Mike really, you know, um, documents uh, evidence showing how much trouble they're in, that they, they're having trouble staffing certain places because they just don't have the people. But what I noticed a couple of years ago and much more uh, in, in the last year is that at the same time that he's pretending that he's expanding around the globe, He's really been pulling back to one location, and that's Clearwater, Florida. They have these big headquarters in Los Angeles and in England and in Sydney, Australia, but really more and more the resources are going to Clearwater. And then I, did, I was the one that broke the news that Tom Cruise has purchased this new double penthouse that's being uh, constructed now right in the middle of their base. Uh, and I thought that was significant. Now, at the time, his mother was ailing. She lived just down the road. I think he wanted to be close to her. She passed away. Um, I don't know if that's going to change his, his plans or not. But Miscavige it just made a, a pitch to the city council in Clearwater that Tom Cruise was actually going to be involved in, in, the, in the changes he wants to make uh, downtown. So, you know, Tom and Dave are on board together. Um, they've been buying more and more property. I, I think that David Miscavige realizes with the with the shrinking going on that he's going to have to make a last stand somewhere. And I think it's going to be in Clearwater, Florida. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you have to get, in order for the rally to be effective, you've got to get as many people into a smaller amount of area. To you know, 5,000 people will seem like a lot, even if that's the quarter of the entire world population. You know? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a big town. Uh, yeah. I think the total population of Clearwater is 100,000. 
and um, about five thousand of that is Scientologists. So yeah. you know they they already feel like and they and they and they've taken over downtown. So um, I, I I think you're going to see more and more that he's going to focus on that town, and you'll see because Los Angeles is really hurting right now. The LA the LA we see more and more evidence that he's he's having a hard time even staffing it. So um, even though a lot of us, you know, whenever you see a picture of when somebody wants to represent Scientology, they usually show that building in L.A. Right. I think more and more it's Clearwater that's the center of the Scientology universe now. Any idea on like how they're doing financially? Because buying all these new places, grand openings, I mean, that, that the cost of ownership and, you know, paying property taxes and, and just, you know, the maintenance of, of these facilities – like that's gotta that's gotta hurt, especially if they're well, they not revenue they generators. They don't pay property taxes. They don't pay property taxes because mm. they got that right. tax exempt status okay. from the IRS. Yeah. But yeah, no, some of these buildings, um, they buy them, and then they don't have the money to renovate them, and they just rot. So you have that problem in places like Montreal and Chicago and Philly and Detroit. Uh, they just have these buildings that are just empty and rotting. Um, but yeah, I, I think at some point that the the real estate thing is going to backfire on them. Some people think that he's investing all this money, but other people have pointed out to me that these are unique buildings that might be tough to sell when it comes time to do it. Uh, but as far as the money, uh, it's a little tough. We have a better idea now than we did just a few years ago. A law was passed in 2006. I got to figure out who was behind that law and shake his hand because there was a law that was passed in 2006 that even churches, if they make money – uh, which is called unrelated business income. Like some churches will like sell T-shirts and stuff um, that's like unrelated to their their everyday business. Yeah. You have to file a tax return for mm-hmm. that, even if it's only to report that twenty thousand or thirty thousand because you rented out your sanctuary for a concert or something. You have to report that. But the best thing about it's called a nine ninety T form. The best thing about that form is on the front at the near the top. There's a little box that says book value you have to say how much that business yeah. is worth oh. and and we just discovered this a couple of years ago that they had to file these 990t reports on some of their not all but some of their biggest entities like the church of scientology international religious technology center church of spiritual technology and so that's right there they had to they had to say what they're worth and just those first just that first year we got um just those three top entities were worth, I think, a little over two billion dollars. She's still and a that's lot. Just, that that's is... just three of their like fifty entities. So um, we got a couple more reports out of them, and they 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 were continuing to increase. And now it's getting tougher. And I think they might have figured out that they need to stop selling T-shirts or whatever. It right, is, right. So they don't have to file those reports anymore. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the other thing for me why it's so frustrating is with all of that money, you could really do some good in the world. Like you can help people that don't have water. You can help people that don't have education and, you know, medicine and things like that. And, you know, really, what are they doing outside of smear campaigns and a it was what sounds like a terrible television channel that's going to be on <laughs> Spectrum. I mean, you know, we should we should take some of our material and submit it and see if they'd put it up, but I, I doubt they would. But uh, you know, outside of that, what are they actually doing for humanity? Right. Well, they're they're very aware of that, and so they have this whole wing, which they call their social betterment groups, which are supposed to put on the appearance that they're doing good, and so they involve Narcanon, the drug rehab. Uh, network, which is in big trouble because patients have been dying and they've been getting sued because it's really not what they say it is. Um, instead of getting drug counseling, you get Scientology training. <laughs> oh, nice. Wow. That's, that's one of them, Narconon. And then another one is they have this human rights campaign, Youth for Human Rights, where they basically just took the 1948 United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which is a great document. It was, it was basically created by Eleanor Roosevelt, a wonderful document about human rights. But Scientology pretends that it's like the champion of it and puts out all these videos about, no, your rights and stuff like that. And it's just, you know, they're, they're so shameless. Here they are violating the human rights of children that they employ yep. around the clock. And they're out pr- pr- pretending that they promote human rights. Um, and then they have a couple of other front groups that uh, uh, there's the thing called CCHR, which is the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, which attacks psychiatry. And they have yep. another one that um, is called Applied Scholastics, where they try to get L. Ron Hubbard's um, ideas about education into the schools, uh, which are 
just really lame. Wow. And uh, and that's that's it. That, that, you know, if you ask them what good works do the church Scientologists do, they'll say, oh, we promote literacy in the schools, we promote a drug free lifestyle, and we promote human rights, which all sounds good until you start to look into it and realize each of these groups is just trying to uh, promote the reputation of L. Ron Hubbard. Mm-hmm. Right. Smoke and mirrors. Right, lobbyists, if you will. But have they modified the, the 1948 charter at all? I know the, no, the, no, no. the Islamic no. world did. You know, they didn't want to sign the, you know, the direct declaration of human rights. So they're just kind of Interesting. pushing it, but not necessarily living by it. No, they just, they're, they're pretty straight about that. Okay. You know, they, this is, these are the kind of people that can, you know, they're employing 12 year olds at 90 hours a week for no pay, but they can look you in the face and say, you know, there shouldn't be child labor. That's one of the human rights. You know, I mean, yeah. they, they're shameless that way. Yeah. Tony, is there any uh, is there any stories you can kind of give us a, a little glance at that you're kind of working on right now? Well, I'm I'm very curious to see what Leah's coming up with, and I'm I'm trying to find out uh, what's what's going to be in her show. Um, that's going to be, um, I think, just real dynamite. I think it's going to be in June, something like that. And um, other than that, no, I, I guess that's the the big thing coming. I, I was I was concerned about you know how how much. Reza Aslan's story was going to set us back, but I, I felt in general it was kind of dull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will say, you know, I mean, I know he has a following and things like that, but he really is not taken as a genuine scholar in the field. Like, you, you know, his his opinions are not. In my opinion, again, <laughs> I could be, I could be misrepresenting the the position, but I know just based on conversations I've seen with actual scholars, his his opinions are not. You know, yeah, his his own base has kind of turned against him a little bit. I mean, I, again, his base tends to be the apologist crew right. and super, super. Let's not offend anybody, crew. But his version on Hinduism like ruffled a lot of feathers too. You know, I I don't necessarily think he intended that, but you know that that's a problem when you get ideologic. Yeah, you you'll, you'll, you'll get eaten by your own people, and that's what's happening. That's true. Well, Tony, thank you so much for the time. It's always fantastic and fascinating, all the stuff that you're writing about. And, you know, I think I honestly do think that Scientology is under the scope right now. I think as far as the public goes, people are starting to pay attention. And, you know, with with Leah's show, with my Scientology movie, Going Clear really did, you know, a great job getting this out there. And, you know, Ron telling a story now and, you know, it's really exciting to see you know, hopefully what we, we start to see is, you know, Scientology falling apart bef- before our very eyes. I just want, I just want, pub- I just want the public to know so they can make their own decision. I mean, if you still want, if you've listened to this podcast or you've written, read my blog and you still want to join Scientology, that's your business. That's fine. As long as yeah. you're educated about it. Yeah. I just, you know, I think for the longest time, groups like this have been able to harm people because they operate on the idea that most people just don't know what they're getting into. Yeah, and that and that's the that's the real wicked piece for me is the fact that you know they're they're te- they're selling you something up front as far as you know how to improve yourself as a communicator and a person and all these things and on the back end they're taking advantage of you your family and in some you know in some cases families are in prison and don't have the ability to just leave you know and. and uh, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, all of it, you can just leave. You can convert to something else for, for the majority. I know there's some fundamentalist <laughs> sects, but for the most part, you can just leave and you make a decision and say, I'm going to be something else. And Scientology has it to where people can't even do that. So yeah, I think all fundamentalist religions and of, of any stripe, you know, Islam comes to mind, but this, this is true for the Westboro Baptists and all those. If right. They, that, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses all have disconnection policies that they call some, something else. Yeah, and yeah, that's sad. So, well, Tony, thank you again so much. Yeah. Uh, we're going to keep you on the line here for a second. Uh, we're just going to close it out here. Um, have me on. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again. You're you're a, a brilliant um, a brilliant mind when it comes to this. Absolutely on top of it and a wealth of knowledge. So, absolutely appreciate the uh, the interview. You're too kind. Thank you for listening to Myth Informed. Myth Informed is brought to you by Mythicist Milwaukee. Producer Sean Frasick, associate producers Fritz Blondon and Kristen Whitaker Hood, engineer Josh Benishik, technical consultant Jason Lawson, and hosts Brian, Dimitri, Jacob, and Joseph. Every week we produce a new podcast that sheds light on religion, secularism, and mythology. If you enjoy this show, please support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash mythicist. 
Mythicist Milwaukee also brings major secular conferences and debates to the Milwaukee area, along with community events, both local and online. To support us in bringing future events, become a member at mythicismilwaukee.com to receive member-only benefits. You can also visit mythicismilwaukee.com and hit the donate button located at the bottom of each page to place a financial donation amount of your choice. And now, the closing theme, written and performed by Shelley Siegel.